Okay, everybody, welcome back. We are just about to get started. So get comfortable for the last three talks of our weather and climate session. We'll start in just about just a few seconds. And Maria, are you ready to go? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, we have three more talks and then an opportunity for a larger discussion and question session with all of today's speakers. So stick around. Uh, we, the next two talks, we're gonna be talking something about convection and storms, but very different perspectives, I believe, on the problem. And then we're gonna end with a meta-learning um, perspectives for remote sensing, but really meta-learning, as we've seen already the last two days, is something that appears to be very applicable to many different aspects of, of, of many different scientific fields. With that, um, Maria, take it away. Thanks, Libby. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Molina, and I'm currently an Advanced Study Program Postdoctoral Fellow at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators on this work, David John Gagne and Andreas Prime, both scientists at NCAR. Today, I'll be sharing some of my postdoctoral research, which has focused on training a convolutional neural network to perform a classification task of thunderstorms. And we care about classifying thunderstorms because there is a subset of convection that has a greater likelihood to produce severe hazards, which in our case include tornadoes and large hail. And many different physical variables and parameters have been found to help with their identification and prediction. But one variable that has been found to be very useful for identifying storms more likely to produce these severe hazards is updraft helicity. And updraft helicity takes into account the vert vertical velocity of winds, which gives us some information on the strength of a storm's updraft and vertical vorticity, which is the spin in the atmosphere. A stronger rotation implies that a storm is more likely to be a supercell, a morphology that has more frequently been associated with the production of severe hazards. Now, in past studies of severe storms that use high resolution model output, certain fixed thresholds of updraft helicity have shown good performance for identifying these storms that are more likely to produce these severe hazards. And in these examples that I'm sharing here, we're considering a threshold of 75 meters squared per second squared. And so for the example that exceeds that threshold, we can see a more organized structure associated with that storm. And the example that does not exceed that threshold that's below it, we see less organized structure. And so less organization suggests that that storm would be less likely to produce some of these severe hazards. Now, while these thresholds are helpful, they do fail to generalize. For example, there may be some storms that fall just below that threshold, but still have some supercell structure to them. And we can perhaps improve on this limitation by training a convolutional neural network to perform this classification task using these thresholds or heuristics as labels. And the benefit of using a CNN with several layers is that we can learn different level features of storms that could perhaps provide useful information. And by using heuristics as labels, we can bypass the need of having to hand label a large number of examples. Now we can spend a lot of time tuning and training a model to perform a classification task, but what happens when it encounters an extreme event? And as the climate continues to change and we face more extreme outlier events, what will happen to the model's performance in those cases? But perhaps more important is knowing why a model is able to perform well or not. What are the physical reasons for the decisions made by our model? Model simulations that we use for the study were created by the NCAR water system program using WERF at four kilometer grid spacing. There is a historical and a future climate simulation. Here we can see a visualization of them. The historical climate simulation is on the left and it was created using ERA interim data, which is a reanalysis product. And that was used for initial and boundary conditions. And then the future climate was also initialized using ERA interim but with an added climate perturbation that was derived from a set of 19 CMET5 models using the RCP 8.5 greenhouse gas concentration pathway, which is just a very high baseline emission scenario. And something that you'll notice 
with these two simulations is that in our future climate, we do have greater water vapor content, but the large scale flow is generally very similar between the current and the future climate simulation. And that's because large scale spectral nudging was applied to keep the large scale pattern um, in line with the boundary conditions. Um, but there is still some flexibility in that threshold that was set. So our thunderstorms do change from a thermodynamic perspective and to some ex extent spatially and temporally. Now, storm objects were extracted from both of these climate simulations using the watershed method, which consists of three steps. First, storm cores are identified. In this case, we use 40 dBZ as our maximum threshold, which is just a quantity derived from um, some simulated radar and provides an estimate for precipitation intensity. Then following that, uh, we go ahead and grow out these objects to a minimum intensity, which we denoted to be 20 dBZ. And then we save these objects as patches that contain some of the surrounding information uh, surrounding the storm, which we assume to be influential for their upcoming classification. Now, we did not train our models using simulated radar reflectivity from the model output. We trained them using 20 environmental variables that we extracted matching each of our storm objects. These include the following variables listed here, and these were interpolated onto four different vertical heights. So one, three, five, and seven kilometers above ground level. Then following uh, the extraction of these environments, I went ahead and split up the data into two groups, a training and a testing set split at 60 and 40%. And then these were standardized by subtracting the mean of the respective population and then dividing by the standard deviation. So here is the architecture of our deep learning model. We applied three two-dimensional convolutional layers with an increasing number of activation maps that decrease in spatial extent due to max pooling. And then after that, we flatten our data and we pass it through two dense layers. ReLU activation was used after each one of these layers with the exception of the final dense layer where we applied a sigmoid transformation. And we did that uh, to extract values that are between zero and one, which we can um, uh, use as information as um, an estimate to the probability that our storm is either strongly rotating or not. So values closer to one, we consider to be strongly rotating and values closer to zero, we assume to be non-strongly rotating. Now, a benefit of these layers is that the um, earlier activation maps show low level features of our data and later uh, future maps show more complicated features in our data. So we went ahead and trained our model only using the current climate simulation data. And this were, these were 13 years uh, in the months of December, January, February, March, April, May. And then we evaluated using the future climate that is unseen. And this is an estimate for the late 20th century. And we end up with um, two classes, strongly rotating storms or non-strongly rotating. But within those two classes, there will be some incorrect classifications. And so those are our false alarms when our model thought it was a strongly rotating storm, but it was not, and then misses when our model thought it was not strongly rotating, but it indeed was. Uh, and important to note is that we have a large imbalance in our data set. Uh, most of our examples are not strongly rotating storms. So for evaluation, it was really important for us to consider metrics that were not heavily dependent on true negatives. So we really focus on those strongly rotating storms or the misses. And so here we have a performance diagram. We have success ratio on the x-axis, probability of detection on the y-axis, contour showing critical success index, and these diagonal dashed lines show bias. But importantly, just to um, what we're seeing here is that these curves are our model with varying probability thresholds, and this is their performance. And we can interpret this plot as curves that are towards the top right show good performance. The red line is the future storm objects. And then the purple shows a subset of the future climate, which are outlier storms. And we chose those based on storms that had the very high end moisture content. So exceeding the 95th percentile of low level moisture. And so we see very good performance for both of these cases in the future climate, but why? And so one way we can ask the why is by using permutation feature importance, where we shuffle one input channel or a variable in our case, and we evaluate the model skill. 
So we focus on critical success index as our evaluation metric. And on the left-hand side, we have our future climate storms or the outliers. And results were very similar for both of these uh, subsets of storms. We see that kinematic variables were identified to be the most important for um, good performance in our model. And that makes sense because our label data was created using a draft helicity, which is a rotation measurement. But on the right hand side, we see something interesting that happens. If we take an unseen, uh, an unseen set of current climate storms and perform permutation future importance, we actually get our third most important variable to be a moisture variable, even though it wasn't used in that creation of the label. And so this tells us something very interesting, which is that maybe that ver moisture variable is important for our current climate storms, but perhaps our model uh, learned to ignore it when looking at storms that lied outside of that moisture distribution. And if we use a different um, evaluation metric, in this case, Breyer skill score, um, which considers some of the underlying distribution of the data, we see something even more interesting, which is that that same moisture variable now is showing up as the third most important variable in our future climate and outlier cases, but is the most important in our current climate. So this further suggests that our model is able to reprioritize some of these input channels based on what their magnitudes are uh, and possibly um, also reduces that sensitivity to outliers. And uh, this is what makes our model be able to remain skillful. But we also wanna consider now some of the spatial features or spatial aspects of our data. And we wanna evaluate our, store, our model in that way. And so for that, we can use saliency maps, which specifically plot the grading of the predicted outcome from the model with respect to the input. And so in this case, I am sharing some saliency maps from a correctly classified example. And the saliency maps show zonal and meridional, and meridional winds. So in the X direction and in the Y direction. And we see something that resembles a storm mesocyclone. So these gradients plotted here, uh, we can refer to point in the direction of our data, meaning red colors are positive gradients and for U winds and on the X direction are from west to east. And then the respective directions for uh, the Y axis winds. And so this makes a lot of sense because the patterns look like storm mesocyclones, which is great. It means that our model is identifying something physical. When we consider a, saliency, a set of saliency maps for wind patterns of true negative events, we see that the CNN identified broader areas that were not organized. And for mirroring on the winds, we actually winds, see winds generally going from south to north, which suggests some inflow towards this less organized convection, which checks out also uh, in the real world. But what about when the model got examples wrong? And so here we have some false alarms. Um, and this is a, an example where the updraft helicity value was just below the 75 meters square per second squared uh, value for updraft helicity that we denoted. And we see that spatially, the model still identified regions of strong rotation, but classified it as a strongly rotating storm because updraft helicity was just below that fixed threshold. And if we go ahead and bin and create this histogram, of um, frequencies of updraft helicity values for all of our false alarms in the study, we actually see that most of them were indeed higher values of updraft helicity, but just below that threshold. So this is valuable because um, it shows us that our model learned something and is still identifying strongly rotating storms, um, even if they fall just below that threshold. Now for our misses, um, here we find that most of the failures occurred when the feature of interest, in our case, uh, strong rotation, was located near the edge of the storm object. And so here we again have histograms, but this time in the spatial um, extent of our storm objects, the yellow shows higher frequencies of these maximum values of updraft helicity, most of them occurring in the edge of the storm patch for our misses. If we look at the same histogram for HIT, so correctly identified strongly rotating storms, most of the time that was towards the center of our storm object. So this is likely the reason why our model in this case is failing. Even though spatially with our saliency maps, we see that it still found um, some strong rotation near the center of the storm. 
And so to conclude, um, just three highlights here is that we have learned that our deep learning model can perform well even when faced with extreme outlier events um, that are associated with this classification task. We know that there is some physical, uh, some physical features that were learned uh, from our convolutional neural network and that it can actually also learn uh, using some heuristic data or perhaps in more advanced cases for other um, weather or climate examples that um, use expert systems to create labeled data. Maybe uh, this could be a very useful application for those um, detection um, um, tasks as well. And um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. That was great. Um, so we have, we have a few questions here and we have some time. So, um, we, one of the questions was, is, is there any way to quantify, this is, you know, the one that we all get, is there any way to quantify the number of extreme events that are needed in your training data set? So again, this question of how much data do you need? Hmm. Um, I guess I'm not sure how much data I need, um, in an earlier iteration of, um, this model, uh, where I actually considered training using balanced data. So I thought that this highly imbalanced data set where most of the events were not strongly rotating and only a small subset were strongly rotating would pose a problem for our model. Uh, so I went ahead and artificially balanced the data set to have an equal amount of strongly rotating and non-strongly rotating storms. And this really decreased my sample size. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head what that percent decrease was, but it, there was still some very good performance um, there as well. Um, so I don't know how many are needed. Um, as far as for our test data set, we have close to or in excess of 400,000 um, examples. So if you can think whatever 60% is, um, like, yeah, uh, there were quite a few examples. So over 500,000 for training. Great, thank you. And you have other questions, but we're gonna save those for the panel at the end. So don't go anywhere. Okay, great. So thank you. And Tom, um, you're up next, which means go ahead and grab the screen. Okay. Should I wait until um, 20 to start my talk or would you like to start me now? I think it's just fine to start now. Thank you very much. This, this panel, this group has just been so on time. We don't know what to do with ourselves. So thank you, let's, let's go for it. So good morning, afternoon or evening everyone. My name is Tom Buechler and I am an assistant project scientist at UC Irvine affiliated with Columbia University. And today I will share some of our recent progress towards developing physically consistent and data-driven models of convection. I would like to thank uh, Elizabeth Barnes and Emir Ebert Uphoff, as well as the KGML organizing committee for inviting me today, as well as uh, my co-authors listed uh, below. The primary motivation for this talk is that our largest uncertainty in uh, long-term climate projection come from clouds. More specifically, models fail at representing the effects of fine scale cloud and turbulence on climate because most climate models use a coarse grid with empirical models of clouds, which distorts the multi-scale interaction between climate, convection, and clouds. Fortunately, thanks to computational advances, we are now able to run global simulations with a grid fine enough to explicitly simulate deep cloud systems. However, because of computational limits, we are only able to run such simulations for a short period of time. For example, one year, which pales in contrast to the 100 year simulations we need for long-term climate projections. Now, the third motivation is that in parallel to the development of global cloud resolving models, progress in stochastic optimization has improved machine learning algorithm to the point where they can be trained on these high resolution simulation to then accurately mimic the effect of deep cloud systems on climate. And to make things a little more concrete, 
um, I'm going to show you the setup that we typically use in our lab to machine learn uh, subgrid scale thermodynamics for climate modeling. We use the superparameterized community atmosphere model, which combines an exterior coarse model similar to traditional climate models, coupled to two dimensional cloud resolving models that are embedded within each grid cell. And they produce a more faithful response of clouds, convection, and fun scale turbulence to the large scale environment. And so by training a neural network on the, for example, the first year of these superparameter simulations, we can unambiguously emulate the mapping from large scale thermodynamics to how convection and fine scale turbulence redistribute water vapor and temperature in the vertical. And therefore we can accelerate the course, um, we can accelerate the superparameterized model by two orders of magnitude while still keeping the advantages provided by the cloud resolving models in the superparameterized models. And so now visually what that looks like is that on top, I'm showing you uh, the original superparameterized model. And at the bottom, I'm showing you the neural network emulation. And what you can see is that um, despite a, a little bit of loss of the variability, the neural network does a relatively good job at emulating both the convective moistening on the left and the convective heating on the right. Now we are at the very dawn of what we can do with machine learning emulation of climate models. And there are a lot of problems we need to address. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk about three problems. The first problem is that machine learning algorithm typically violate conservation laws. So on the top, I'm showing you the residual for, from the mass conservation equation. And on the bottom, the residual from the enthalpy conservation equations. I'm gonna take several samples from my climate models and run them through the neural networks. If the neural networks perfectly conserved mass and energy, uh, we would have a lot, of, uh, all the samples would have zero residual from the mass and enthalpy conservation. Instead, if we take a typical neural network, we get a lot of energy and mass violation up to 100 watt per meter square, just within one time step, which is very problematic from a climate modeling perspective, even if the accuracy could be decent. Now, a second problem is that machine learning algorithm typically fail to generalize to out of sample climates or out of sample atmospheric regimes. So here I'm taking a daily mean tropical profile um, from a reference climate. And I'm trying to predict the convective moistening, which is how water vapor is redistributed in the vertical by convection and clouds. In black is the truth. And here are uh, the predictions from different neural networks. In blue are brute force neural networks uh, and other networks that were engineered to this time conserve mass and energy. They all perform well on the reference climate. However, if I now warm my, condition, my surface by four Kelvin, and reevaluate those neural networks in this new climate, what you can see is that they tend to produce very large errors, including the neural networks that were constrained to physically, uh, physically constrained to conserve mass and energy. And this is the second central issue we will address today. The third issue I wanted to talk about arises when we take a step back from the modeling world and look at the global, uh, the current global observing system. So we can, we can currently approximate the large scale thermodynamics state to a reasonable extent and directly inform the development of climate models. But then the same statement cannot be made for the moistening and heating tendencies from convection that we are interested in if we want to resolve uh, these problematic clouds for climate models. Um, because these are residual quantities that we cannot directly measure it, and so we can only accurately measure them via costly and targeted fill campaign, such as the recent Eureka fill campaign in the Barbados. And what that implies is that we have to work if we want to resolve the effect of cloud and convection on the climate with very sparse and localized data to develop data-driven parameterization of convection. And this is challenging. So these three problems lead to the central question of my talk today, which is directly in line with the workshop's goal. 
How can we design models of convections that are both physically consistent and data-driven, including cases where data is sparse? And my talk will have three parts. First, I will compare two methods to enforce conservation laws in neural networks and introduce the notion of architecture and loss-constrained neural networks. Second, I will show how physical rescaling can help neural network generalize and introduce the notion of climate invariant neural network. And finally, I will show that these climate invariant neural networks learn more general mapping from climate to convection with very little data, with the potential of facilitating transfer learning between idealized and realistic atmospheric data. And uh, finally, note that while I am investigating the specific a case that, is, that can seem quite specific of uh, subgrid scale thermodynamics deep learning parameterization for climate modeling, the framework that I'm going to show today has ideas that are general enough to be applied to machine learning emulation of physical models, for example, uh, but not limited to meteorological and oceanic models. So coming back to the first problem motivating this talk, we ask, how can we enforce physical constraints in data-driven models of convection? In our case, we'll propose solutions adapted, applied uh, to the conservation of mass, energy, and radiation in neural networks. And we use neural networks in our case because they have high represent representation power um, and scalability. Uh, but some of these ideas could be transferred to other machine learning algorithms. So the first step is to add all the terms uh, informing conservation laws to the neural network's inputs or outputs. And once you do that, I'm going to present two options to enforce conservation laws in neural networks. The first option has already been covered in this workshop is to introduce soft constraints in the loss function by introducing a penalty for violating conservation which in essence is similar to a Lagrange multiplier. So the loss function is in the sum of a performance loss, for example, mean squared error, and then a weighted term that represents how much the neural network violates conservation law, for example, the squared residual from the conservation laws I showed you earlier. And then the second option I'm gonna to introduce today is how to enforce hard constraints in, by changing the architecture of the neural network. Um, and more specifically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce a general method we developed to enforce conservation's law to machine precision, to within machine precisions, uh, which I'm showing below. So we start with a standard neural network, mapping inputs X to an output vector Y of total length P. But if we have N constraints that we exactly know in this case, Instead of directly outputting P components, we only output P minus N components. And then we calculate the remaining components using fixed constraints layer layers that encode the conservation loss. And then by concatenating both these direct and residual outputs, we can optimize the neural networks using the whole output vector, which means that the loss function gradients can propagate through the constraints layers which means that the constraints in the end inform the final weights and biases of the standard neural network that we optimized. So now onto the results. I'm gonna first show you the mean squared error of the two different uh, options I presented and show you that when we use loss constraint networks, there is a trade-off between performance of the network and physical constraints of the network. So on the y-axis is a mean squared error representative of the skill of the neural network. We start with an unconstrained network where we haven't enforced any constraints. Up is bad, down is good. First, if we look at a multi multiple linear regression, we should always uh, start with simple examples. We can see that we do significantly better than a linear regression as the y-axis uses a log scale, which is reassuring. It was useful to use a neural network to begin with. However, once we look at the squared residual from uh, the conservation law, which is the energy or the mass leak, what we see is that um, 
the neural network, the typical neural network violates uh, conservation law so much that it does worse than the linear regression. And then as we enforce conservation with more and more weights in the loss function, we can see that the neural network follows conservation laws more and more closely. While it performs worse and worse. So there is a trade-off here. Well, if we enforce conservation's law in the architectures of the neural network, the constraints are enforced within machine precision and we get competitive performance, which we're quite happy about. Now I'm gonna transition to the second problem, which is that even when you physically constrain the networks, they still fa fail to generalize, as I showed in the motivation of this talk. And the idea was um, that we had is to first break the model even more to better understand our failure case. And so we're gonna introduce a very provocative generalization experiment where we train and validate our models on a cold aquaplanet simulation and then test the models in the deep tropics of a warm climate that has a surface that's eight Kelvin warmer than the cold climate. So from the perspective of the surface temperature, here's the cold climate, here's the warm climate, um, here is the deep tropics where the warm climate has surface temperatures that uh, the neural network would have never seen if it was trained on the cold climate. And so we train the cold, uh, we train the neural network on a cold climate and we test it out of sample in the tropics of the warm climate in purpose to break it as much as we can to better understand how it works. So taking a daily mean tropical prediction in the cold climate, the first condition is to check that a neural network is a good fit. So it is a decent fit in the cold reference climate. And now we look at the deep tropics of a warm climate. It's now eight Kelvin warmer and it fails even more miserably. And our goal is gonna to be to help the network give it physical information so that it can generalize better to this warm climate. And so the framework that I'm showing today is based on physical rescaling of the data so as to convert what is an extrapolation problem into an interpolation problem. Um, and so the brute force network is not climate invariant in the sense that you cannot use the same mapping from the cold climate and the warm climate since it breaks. And we want to physically rescale this variable so as to make it climate invariant. And we're going to ask how to choose that physical rescaling. Know that it's not a well-defined problem because there could be several physical rescalings at work. And today I'm going to show a physical rescaling that gives us promising results. And that is based on the main mode of failure of a neural network coming from the clausius clapeyron relation, which implies an exponential relationship between water vapor and surface temperature. And this is a striking nonlinearity, which is the main cause in our case uh, of the failure of a neural network, as it is hard to extrapolate without knowing that upper bound dictated by physics. If you just look at the blue curve, the cold climate, the neural network could very well predict uh, the warm climate to go in this direction with the orange arrow or this direction. And both of them would be correct from the cold data in a sense, uh, but would lead to significant errors in the warm climate. And so the idea is to use that upper bound to better extrapolate to a warm climate. And just for the interest of time, um, I'm gonna skip over some of the uh, algorithm and just give you one example, which is that the main, if we uh, rescale the specific community, which is an input of a neural network model of convection uh, to relative humidity, which tends to be more climate invariant. As you can see, it has more similar probability distribution functions. Uh, we can go from what seems to be an extrapolation problem to an interpolation problem and dramatically improve our generalization results. Now I overestimated my time a little bit here, so I'm gonna skip uh, just to get to the interesting part, uh, to the last part of my talk. Uh, you can replay this game for temperature and latent heat flux and the resulting climate invariant neural networks in gen uh, generalize better to unseen climate. You can get to a reasonable performance in a warm climate, even if it was never trained on it and it's really far surface temperature wise. The last result that I wanted to share is that, um, and I think the next speaker can speak more about it, is that if once you physically rescale um, those neural networks, 
and then use them to do transfer learning from idealized dark planet data to real geography data, which is quite analogous to a problem we have in, um, to, a, to an idea a lot of climate scientists already have, which is to train the neural network to extract all this rich information we have from climate models and then fine tune it using observations to produce more realistic model. Um, we can recreate that idea. We have a numerical laboratory for that idea where we oscillate between aquaplanet, ocean world simulation and real geography simulation. What we can see is that as we transfer from an ocean world to a real geography world um, and look at the performance of the climate models on the y-axis, with no data, even with no data, the climate invariant neural network is significantly better at guessing the, the different regimes. So even if it has only ever seen an ocean world, it performs much better on a real geography planet than a brute force neural network. And it also tends to learn more with less data, less sample trained on. And these are exciting preliminary results um, that confirm that climate invariant networks, maybe like physical rescalings, could be a way forward to improve the generalization properties of neural networks from um, the climate we live in, and we can take observations of uh, from that climate to a future climate that we don't yet have observations from. Um, so I'm just going to skip to the conclusion is that we can make neural network models of convection physically consistent by enforcing physical constraints, either approximately in the loss function or exactly by modifying their architecture. And that we can help neural networks generalize, generalizing by physically rescaling inputs and outputs. And I want to note that those are two different methods of incorporating, taking a step back and going back to the workshops themes. These are two different ways of incorporating physical knowledge in neural networks. Um, so the forward arrow described by Elizabeth Barnes uh, for different purposes. Finally, we also find that climate invariant neural networks learn more general mappings and facilitated transfer learning, which is an excited, um, and one aspect I find particularly exciting about that is that what it means is that physics guided machine learning may be one of our most promising tools to assimilate sparse observational data from observational field campaigns into global climate models in a way that's physically consistent. Um, and with that, thank you all for attending and below is a link to my website uh, where I share preprints, code and resources related to my research. Thank you again and I'll, uh, yep. Thank you, Tom. So we have some questions here. We don't have, we only have question, time for one question right now and we'll take the rest of the panel. So one question came in is, which other applications do you think your methods would apply to? Anything in mind, any low hanging fruits? So our application is to replace existing par empirical parameterizations convection in climate models, which are the main uh, sources of uncertainty for long-term climate projection with uh, machine learning parameterizations. And uh, those are two ways of making those machine learning parameterizations, which are probably, uh, which are gonna appear more and more, I'm expecting in the community, more robust. Uh, which means they will produce less generalization errors and will have better control over how much mass and energy they leak. Um, but then other um, applications are any system where you have a strong physical prior of how you change from, for example, regime A to regime B, but you only have data from regime A and you also want to predict regime B. Um, and I think that's relatively general. All right, thank you. With that, we turn it over to Sherry. Feel free to grab the screen. Take it away. Okay, great. Can you guys see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so today, um, so sorry. Uh, my name is Sherry and I'm a fifth year PhD student at Stanford and today I'm going to talk about a meta learning for remote sensing, which is um, we were just talking about transfer learning um, in the previous talk and this is one way to explicitly optimize a neural network for transfer learning. So this is a work uh, with Mark Roosform, who's at TU Munich. Mark is advised by Marco 
Kerner at TUM and David Lobel is my advisor at Stanford. So the reason that Mark and I were motivated to work on meta-learning is because both of us have worked on crop mapping and crop type mapping over the last few years throughout our PhD. And we have been doing this all over the world. I've been working mostly in the US and Mark has been doing a lot of work in Europe. Um, and I've also done crop mapping in India and in parts of Africa. And what we noticed was that every time we go to a new location and we want to perform some sort of crop classification, um, we basically start from scratch. Uh, even though if you observe crop land all over the world, you notice that certain traits are shared across regions, no matter um, where in the world you are. So here we're showing four examples from Brazil, Poland, Mali, and Angola of cropland. So you'll notice that, yes, the background vegetation looks different in each place. The size of fields can be different, but you still have similarities such as um, the fact that crop fields are for the most part rectangular and very regular in shape, as well as the fact that crops, they all, uh, they tend to grow over the course of uh, the growing season and then senesce or AKA uh, die or are harvested. So over time, they also have many characteristics in common. So traditionally uh, what, we've, what we've tended to do uh, when we do crop mapping is in each region that we're working, we'll take whatever data we have in that region, for example, Brazil, and we will train a model just on that data set. And then if we wanted to go and do some crop mapping in Poland, we would again take whatever data we have in Poland and train a new model there, ignoring the fact that we had any data in Brazil. And when we do this, we wouldn't expect a model that we train in one region to generalize to another region because they're quite different. And in fact, we do observe that when we try to just directly apply a model trained in one place to a different place, often that model just breaks down completely um, and the performance is no better than random guessing. Another thing that um, people in the field of land cover classification often do or can do sometimes is group all of their data into one big data set and then train one model on all of this data to perform classification. And um, this can result in better performance if there's what's called positive transfer between regions, which is uh, another way of saying if figuring out how to classify crops in Brazil helps you also classify crops in Poland. But the downside of this strategy is that your model parameters are completely shared across regions. And so it's not ideal for if you want to add a new region to your data set, like suddenly um, I want to do crop mapping in China, then I would have to retrain from scratch uh, this entire big model again. And also if you have an unbalanced uh, set of data where certain regions have a lot more data than others, which is the state of the world that we uh, currently find ourselves in, then the model will be incentivized to do better on the regions with more data. And that may happen at the expense of regions with less data. And so the, the underlying machine learning problem that we're dealing with here, which um, folks have already covered in previous talks, but I'll just state here with um, a simplified uh, picture, is that the distribution of the training set and the distribution of the test sets often are not, um, they don't, they're, not, they're not the same uh, in our applications when we try to go from one region to another. So in the top panel here, we're showing if it's true that your distribution on your training set is identical to your distribution of the test set. Then when you learn a decision boundary on your training set, the test set um, follows the same data distribution. And so your learned decision boundary applies well to the test set. But when this is, no longer true when your training set and your test set are not uh, under the same distribution. And here we see that the test set has undergone a rotation 
relative to the training set distribution. Then when you take the decision boundary that you learn on your training set and you apply it to the test set, the um, classification performance goes uh, way down. As you can see here, there's gonna be a lot of misclassifications of what's in the blue class and what's in the orange class. So tying this back to our particular application, we see that as we move across the Earth's surface, the representations um, of imagery across the Earth's surface is going to change dramatically from region to region. The plot that you're looking at here is when we ran a bunch of imagery from four regions across the world through a uh, VGG16 network that was pre-trained on ImageNet. And then we took one of the last layers of the ImageNet um, of the VGG output. And then we used that as a feature vector for these images. And then we conducted PCA across all these different um, images, feature vectors. And then we're graphing the first principal component against the second principal component. So here uh, you can basically see that these different regions images cluster. And as you go from region to region, um, the features are shifting across this uh, two-dimensional space. So this is another way of saying that basically images from Mali look more similar to each other than images from say um, Poland uh, on average. And then if you imagine training a classifier on Mali data to say classify two different crop types and let's just say that decision boundary goes through this um, cloud of black points. Then if you were to apply that decision boundary to the uh, imagery in say Brazil over here, the cloud of blue points, then that decision boundary is not going to generalize to data from Brazil. And so your uh, classifier can't transfer to a different region. So instead of trying this direct transfer, we're going to explore a set of methods called meta-learning. And under meta-learning, the model is learning how to learn. So to explain what that means, I'm going to contrast that against uh, two types of learning that people may be more familiar with. So the first is single task learning, which is the case where uh, let's say you're, you have an agent and you want it to know how to hike and walk and ride horses, then you're going to treat all of these tasks as individual tasks and then just train a model from scratch on the data that you have for each one. So that's analogous to the first strategy that I brought up um, a few slides ago where in each region you train on the data set that you have in that region and there's no uh, transfer between regions. The second strategy um, is known as pre-training and fine tuning. So it's, it's starting, this is starting to move into the realm of transfer learning, but it's still a relatively uh, simple transfer learning method. And under pre-training, you have the set of tasks um, that you want the agent to learn to perform, um, but really you're after one of those tasks in particular, for example, here, um, you want the agent to learn how to hike. So you pre-train on a bunch of different tasks because for example, you think that learning how to walk is going to help your agent learn how to hike. And then uh, fine tuning, the fine tuning portion of this is when you refresh your agent or your model on the task that you're actually interested in, in this case, hiking. So this is analogous to uh, pooling a bunch of different regions together and then you might fine tune on one of the regions that you actually care about. Under meta-learning, um, instead, of, instead of doing uh, tr treating the regions or the tasks as totally separate or just grouping them together, you ask the model to observe data from each of these tasks and then learn how to learn each task. So um, for example, it might observe data on how to hike and how to walk and how to ride a bike. And then it's trying to learn uh, the best way to learn a new task from the data that it's observed. And then the end goal is to be able to quickly learn a new task such as ice skating that it's never seen before. 
so that's all pretty abstract. So I'm going to talk about the specific algorithm that um, we look into, which is one of the most well-known um, and uh, most commonly used meta learning algorithms. So this algorithm is called model agnostic meta learning. Model agnostic because it can be used with uh, any neural network architecture that you have. You basically just need something that is trained using a gradient descent based algorithm. And so what uh, model agnostic meta learning or MAML for short is doing is it's taking uh, a model that's initialized with, I'm representing it as a theta here, and it's going to adapt the model to each task you have that you have. So here I'm showing three tasks in this loss landscape. And uh, for each task, you sample a set of data points, and then you use gradient descent to adapt the model theta to um, each task, which we're denoting with the phi's here. So phi one is the adapted model for, uh, mo for task one, phi two is the adapted model for task two and so on. And then you look at how the adapted model did on each task, and then you go back to your initialization and say, how can I make the initialization better so that when I adapt, the ad adapted versions have better performance. So there is not only gradient descent during adaptation, which is the first order gradient descent, there's um, an additional layer of gradient descent on the initialization theta. So this actually involves computing second order derivatives. So if we look at what actually happens when we adapt theta to different regions around the world, um, we see that, again, we're doing a principal component analysis on the parameters that we get after, uh, during, so pre-adaptation here, theta as the black star, and then post-adaptation in two different regions, uh, two different countries in the world, Poland and South Sudan. So you can see that, um, so there's a distribution here because it's a bunch of different tasks with slightly different um, sampled data. And you can see that the Poland tasks cluster together and the Sudan tasks also cluster together. So there's some structure here in the space of neural networks um, where adaptation is leading you to a set of networks that work well in Poland and a set of networks that work well in Sudan. So um, applying MAML to the land cover classification task that we've been talking about means that we're gonna treat geographic regions as meta learning tasks. So be before we were talking about hiking and um, skiing and riding horses, and instead of that, we're gonna have task one be say, trying to classify cropland in Mali, task two, trying to classify cropland in Brazil and so on. And you can see they may have different distributions but you're trying to train models that learn once it sees a new distribution or a few samples from a new distribution, how best to adapt the initialization to this um, new data distribution quickly. So we did two experiments. Um, actually, we did quite a few experiments, but I'm gonna talk about two today. Um, they both have to do with image-based land cover classification. One is on the sun 12 ms data set, which uses Sentinel data and is a global data set. It's multispectral uh, and it's moderate resolution. And then the other one is a, the deep globe data set, which is more local. Uh, we don't know exactly where the data or where the imagery is coming from. And I'll talk about that in a second. It's an RGB and it's super high resolution at 0.5 meters. Then the task that we're going to do for someone to MS is image classification. And for deep globe, it's going to be semantic segmentation. So we chose these two different data sets to span um, moderate and high resolution and also uh, different types of spectrum. So for send one to MS, we're asking the model to perform image classification. So here I'm showing examples from the first, uh, say one particular task in one region, we have one class, which in this case is forest. Um, so even though there's a 
kind of segmented label here, what we did was we took the most common class in the label. So in that case, this is forest. And then say class two here is, for example, croplands. So we're asking the model, here's an example of an image that I'm telling you is a forest. And then here's an example of an image that I'm telling you is cropland. And then I'm going to show you uh, more images from these two classes. And I'm going to ask you to place them in the appropriate class. So that's what the support set and the query set denote. The support set is like analogous to the training set um, in single task learning, only that it's we are calling it support to differentiate it from uh, the meta training and the meta test set. So the support set is the set of data that you see within each task that you're asking the model to adapt using. And the query set is the set of data that the model gets, uh, gets tested on for each task that then you're using to adapt the initialize, to update the initialization of the model. Um, so when we compare mammal against pre-training and random here is, uh, we mean a random initialization of the model. So basically training from scratch. We see that mammal is able to adjust to new distributions with just one shot, which refers to one example from each class that is trying to classify. Um, okay. Whereas, so have, yes. Do you have about two more minutes to wrap up to the three minutes? Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, so we see that uh, basically above one example for each class, mammal is outperforming pre-training and training from scratch. So you can also see at zero shots, um, it's doing worse than the two. And that's because it's not explicitly trained to do well when it doesn't see any data at all. Um, so for deep globe, I'll just go through this quickly. We're basically, we have these very large high resolution images and we're, we're telling the model, I'm going to show you small patches of the image. And then I'm going to ask you to segment um, half of the image that was not part of your support set. And here, uh, what we see is that um, if we split these images in a way that um, makes the training set and the test set different from each other, then let's just focus on the panel on the right. Basically, MAML is outperforming pre-training and a random split. Um, when the training set and the test set images are sufficiently different. And here I'm just showing uh, one example of a case where a mammal is doing pretty well when it gets to see what's in this red box. And then it has to predict the rest of the image here. You can see that it's capturing um, a lot of this magenta class that pre-training and uh, training from scratch are not able to do. So to conclude, um, this application is not directly in the weather and climate, but we're showing that basically meta learning applied to the domain of remote sensing data can help us uh, do well on, do better at least than pre-training and fine tuning on data distributions that are very different from your training distribution. And so the, the hope with this work is that we can open up a new direction toward creating general models that can operate anywhere on earth with just a few training samples. Um, there's a lot of different meta learning algorithms. There's a lot of progress that's been made in this field. So there's still lots to be done um, to explore how meta learning can help us create general uh, earth models. So with that, you feel free to email us or um, contact us for more information about the experiments that we did or check out the paper that we published in uh, CVPR about it. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. Um, so with that, how about we take questions first for Shay? So one question is here is, Shay, does the resulting mammal model result in better representation of key features in the neural network? Better representation of key features. I guess I'm not totally sure what the question means. Could you clarify a bit? My, my, my guess is that it goes in the direction of, you know, often we say in meta learning that 
like earlier layers get most of the information then and you only have to retune the later layers so the earlier ones probably have better feature representation oh i see is that is that the true is that the case in mammal as well oh um yeah so we we didn't look at explicitly what were the filters learned in the convolutional neural network but we did do experiments where we made the um learning rate of each layer learnable. So instead of updating the entire neural network with the learning rate of alpha, we're saying every single layer of the neural network can have a different learning rate. And, and we're going to meta learn those as well. So what we saw there was that um, the learned learning rates of the last layers of the network were quite large. And the learned learning rates of the early layers of the network were relatively much smaller. So that suggests that during adaptation, it's very important to adapt the last layers, which have to do with, you know, which classes you're classifying into. Um, that's more critical for adapting to a new region than maybe some of the very early layers, because again, some of the very early layers, like you mentioned, um, share a lot of features, like just trying to, you know, pick out different features of a landscape. Great. Um, another question also to Shay. Can you fix errors in identification? For example, if the pixel is actually mixed cropland, could it identify a data set not included in the support set? I see. Um, yeah, so actually, yes. Um, basically, what happens is you uh, train the neural network to have a, uh, an output that is uh, you have to you have to say that the network output is going to be a certain size, at least the way that few shot learning is currently structured. So you might say I'm going to do classification into five different classes, or you can do classification into two different classes, whatever it is. Um, but those five can change from task to task. So you can say in task one, I'm going to differentiate the five different crop types that exist in the U.S. and then in Task two, I'm going to differentiate the five main crop types that exist in China. So uh, yes, meta learning is set up to be able to do those sorts of tasks and you can, you can train it to do that. All right, we have one more quick question for you, Shay, and then we turn over to the overall panel. The question sure. is, what is the difference between meta learning and multitask learning? Oh, that's a good question. I actually, I took a class called Deep multitask and meta learning. So they are, they are different. So multitask learning, you're training on um, a bunch of different tasks and you're, you're hoping that there's some, again, positive transfer among them. So training on all of them at once will help you do each one better, or at least the one that you care about better. Um, so the, the training happens uh, for that set of tasks and you care about that set of tasks. For meta learning, you, you also have a set of tasks, but you're training on that set of tasks to do well on a new task that you've never seen before. So multitask learning is not explicitly being optimized to do well on a new task, though you know, training on K tasks may do better on a new task than training on one task, but it is not explicitly being optimized to do that. Whereas meta learning is saying, when I give you a new task, figure out how to do that well. All right, thank you very much. With that, we turn over to the panel. So if we could go to gallery view. Ray, okay, here we go. All right. Great, and uh, so the point of this panel is really to ask, continue to ask more questions because there are quite a few now in Slido, but also um, we'd like to talk about some bigger picture things that everybody could maybe give their perspective on if, if they have thoughts. Um, but I thought it might be fun to start with a few more specific questions and then potentially end on a more philosophical big note, if that sounds all right with everybody. So for those of you watching, um, please, Slido is a great place to add questions where this is this is what we're here for. So it's the end of our of our um, wonderful day of the workshop and we can we can pick everybody's brain. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, one question was to Tom, does your, specifically your architectural approach to enforcing physical constraints require the conservation laws be represented as linear 
combinations of the variables? Is that a requirement? That's a, that's a really good, good question. So in the first version of our work, it used to be that we needed the constraints to be linear combination of the variables. But in the latest version of our work, we, uh, we showed a, how to handle a nonlinear example. And so to handle constraints that are nonlinear in the inputs or outputs, what we do is, um, and it's, it's all uh, detailed in the preprint. We first transform uh, the nonlinear inputs or outputs uh, uh, into variables uh, in which the constraints are linear using the several ways of doing that. You can use custom data generator um, or custom layers as long as your as long as you can write your um, transformation uh, mathematically, you can usually write it in uh, TensorFlow or whatever uh, library you're using. And then you use the same idea, but just inside. So you convert at the from the input to uh, the architecture constraint nerds, you have con uh, conversion layers and from the architecture nets to the outputs, you have conversion layers so that the system is linear inside, but nonlinear overall, so you can still have uh, nonlinear constraints. Um. Great, and actually, I just wanna, since I have you, grab you for another one that's sort of based off that. You talked about multiple methods for enforcing physical constraints. So do you have a general workflow of how you figure out or determine which method is best for the specific application? And maybe you can speak more generally to the audience that may wanna implement these, how they might go about figuring out which one is best for their application. So, so first I want to acknowledge that I'm definitely not the first one to offer such methods. And especially if you go towards the theoretical physics and neural net and machine learning or fluid dynamics and machine learning um, community, there's already a lot of these methods. Um, some of them require, for example, predicted Hamiltonian, only certain components of a tensor that has symmetries. I would say it, it really depends on the problem at hand. In general, my advice would be if, the, if there are obvious way to build your network so that the constraints are verified, uh, do it. So in climate science, it would be, for example, maybe if you care about both fluxes, but also heating rates in your model, go for the fluxes and then consistently calculate the heating rates as uh, differences in these fluxes. And then if you structure your neural network that way, uh, you know that, for example, radiation is going to be conserved and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but the method I proposed in, in a case where, you know, you may not necessarily have such easy ways and the constraints are a bit messy. So uh, I, I, I wrote a general um, and published a more general method, but I would say start with the really easy ones, uh, only output what's necessary. Thank you. Okay, the next question I have, it's Marlena, it's, it's geared mainly towards you, but I think we can make it more general um, to everybody else. So everybody think if you have some thoughts on this for your application, which is in terms of uncertainty estimates or uncertainty quantification, we've already heard a little bit about that today and yesterday, but are there ways to add uncertainty estimates to your causal inference or causal discovery methods? And more generally to the rest of the panel, are, you know, we didn't talk too much about that as a, you didn't talk too much about that as a group, are there ways you're already incorporating uncertainty estimates or are there ways you could see doing that in the future? We'll start with Marlena. Um, yeah, that's a um, good question. <clears throat> and um, I should add probably, um, I think I didn't say it's clearly enough, is that um, in causal inference, let's say the, the causal model I talked about, this is completely non-parametric. So then it depends uh, to you and your choices um, and let's say how you measure um, effects or how you measure statistical dependence. So I presented, let's say, this um, kind of boring um, multiple linear regression framework because I guess this is basically you know, kind of a state of the art, at least in, um, in the context of quantifying effects of teleconnections. And I guess then you can, of course, also use your standard tools to estimate uncertainty for this. Um, in the paper I presented um, where you estimate this effect um, on season five data, what we did was we tested, or we estimated the effects of a different moving windows in the historical um, runs to kind of, um, yeah, get an estimate uh, about, um, yeah, the internal um, variability. And well, it turns out, it's not a surprise that also there was quite a lot of fluctuations of this estimate. Um, so yeah, it's completely the approach 
is really more like a, yeah, maybe even philosophical setup of um, how we can uh, frame those questions, but then it depends on, yeah, your statistics of choice, how you measure it. Anybody else have any thoughts? I mean, you all presented great methods and in terms of how we might work in either uncertainties in our inputs or uncertainties in our outputs or something in between, uncertainty in our models themselves. Tom, do, Tom, go ahead if you have a, an answer. I also, don't, I also want to let other speakers, um, of course, express their views. Uh, in, in the specific case I presented, uh, because we just built standard artificial neural network, we can introduce stochasticity by using a Monte Carlo dropout, for example, to have several different um, output. But in our, in our lab, more generally, we exploring generative and uh, stochastic machine learning methods. And for example, we use variational autoencoders on the generative side. And, um, and we are thinking of maybe trying out Bayesian neural network on the, on the stochastic side. So we have a, an easy methods via dropout, but then there are a lot of other promising tools that I think are worth exploring for the community. All right, we were thinking about mixing in some more philosophical questions here. So one question I have is for the whole panel, what are challenges or roadblocks you see in your applications of KGML in the broader weather climate field and how might we overcome them? Um, well, I can start. Um, I would say data. We need a lot of data in order to apply these things. And for me, I'm working on subseasonal timescales, but if you're looking at more like decadal timescales, we don't have a lot of data. And so if you want to use KGML for this like type of application, you'd need to hopefully increase your data somehow, maybe using a model of some sort. But It's interesting that we're talking about knowledge guide machine learning. How can we bring in the knowledge? It seems like we have a lot of knowledge. We need more data to merge it with, right? To really test things. I can add, um, I guess one of the challenges I see is just a continued physical understanding as to what is happening or, or asking whether there is or isn't um, physical information that our model is learning. And um, for as far as my talk, I um, share some results from permutation future importance. And uh, there are some limitations with that analysis as well, where we can end up uh, with confirmation bias. Um, so let's say we get different results if we explore different error metrics uh, to use for the permutation future importance analysis. Um, and then we might end up just using what seems to confirm what we already know. And if the goal ultimately is to gain knowledge from machine learning, but we're battling our own confirmation bias, when do we actually get to learn new things that maybe we didn't expect? Everybody is nodding vigorously. Does anybody want to add to that? So how do we overcome our confirmation bias? Uh, one of my postdoc mentors, David John Gagne, has suggested writing down what I think is going to come out of the analysis before <laughs> running it. So that'd be a, a very simple way uh, to start battling that. I think another thing that's so hard to do is because we have so little data, we often do the two-way split rather than the three-way split. And so we don't really have our test data. And we, we check once in a while, how, do, how does our model do on the test data? or analyze things. And it's just so hard to really, with little data, to really keep several years really apart and not use them for a long, long time, right? Any yeah, other comments? I, I'm sorry. Yes, I just, yeah, I second that. And actually also what uh, Kirsten said before. So um, and in this context, I also think it's um, kind of this, this methods on, on domain shifts, on uh, regime shifts, is also quite exciting so that we can have less training data or that we can use training data and then apply these results for a different um, case or different uh, model setup, different data case. I think this is um, yeah, important to do, especially we have this variety of different models and um, where 
just from the causal perspective, of course, there's also this um, concept of trans transportability of different causal models. And for example, transporting knowledge we have on, from models uh, on the observations. And I think this is um, exciting and worth studying. Okay, so we, we have another great question that I think applies once again to everyone here. So we are used to always telling everyone in talks how great our method is. So one big question is, what are the real limitations? And I think everybody touched a little bit on this throughout their talk, but maybe everyone could take a moment and, and, and tell us what it, you see are the major limitations of, of the particular method or tools that, you, that you're using right now. Maybe we could start. Kirsten, um, the question was originally geared towards you, so maybe we'll call you out and then we can go around. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so my methods were using layer-wise relevance propagation, and um, there are some limitations to LRP. Uh, mainly, there are some neural network setups that just don't work, such as like UNet, where you can't backpropagate through the model to understand what it looked at. Um, yeah, and it does work for things like CNN and ANN and LSTM, but I think a, a big limitation is if you want to use LRP, you need to think about how you want to set up your model before you go and try to approach a problem so that you can actually use LRP to analyze it. Jerry, do you want to, not to put you on the spot, do you have thoughts on this? Oh yeah, I was gonna jump in and say that for meta-learning, something that we've observed is that um, right now meta-learning methods work really well if you have very few shots, like just maybe one to five examples from each class. But then once you start to have more and more data, then actually the, we've observed pre-training or even training from scratch to overtake meta-learning or MAML. And you, you should think that, I mean, I, I think that that is kind of strange because even with more shots, more samples per class, you're still optimizing the model directly to do well on those larger data sets that you might have. Um, but I think the answer might lie in the fact that because there's all these second order gradients, the loss landscape is quite complicated. It's quite not, um, it's not convex at all. So I think people speculate that that really makes it difficult to find um, a good or a better local uh, minimum than compared to say just pre-training or training from scratch. So something that I'm interested in exploring more is whether as you increase the amount of data that you, that you have to maybe more realistic data set sizes like in the tens or hundreds, which we do have in our fields, um, you can still get the benefit from meta-learning of uh, explicitly learning how to perform well on each task. So there's more of a gradient that you can slide between like um, having only one example to like a thousand examples and have it, have it uh, still outperform some of the more naive training methods. That's exciting. Anyone else? Um, yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Maria and then Marlena. Okay, great. Um, so I use saline C maps and um, I showed a few um, examples that um, showed some features that made sense physically to me. But, um, but if we consider saliency maps in just more general, even for my example, there's a lot of saliency maps that we can generate from our models that are trained. So if we were to just take a look at the last dense layer that I had, that's 32 saliency maps with so 32 neurons plus the 20 inputs. And so you end up with a very large number of saliency maps to sift through. And that can lead to cherry picking and uh, cherry picking by a human that uh, identify some features that make sense to them. Um, and so, again, posing another challenge or barrier for um, this goal of us wanting to extract knowledge from these models. Um, yeah, um, I guess I wanted to say that um, I think well, maybe a specific answer um, or a specific limitation of, of my method or my approach would be that um, since everything is coupled in the climate system, we do need some kind of time lag between processes to really um, understand these um, cause-effect relationships. So I don't think it's really uh, built uh, at the moment to address 
more like chicken egg problems, especially, I don't know, any mean flow interactions, for example. So that's why I think teleconnection connection or more the subseason, season times can make sense. Um, but maybe a bit uh, lazy answer would also be that it's um, where well, all of the methods have limitations. So more like the, the biggest limitation is if we think that one method can answer all the questions. So uh, <laughs> picking the method to your question, but yeah, but this is also very general. <laughs> Tom, did you want to chime in before we go on to the next one? I think everybody else has answered. Up to you. Uh, yes, I can, I can discuss one limitation per method I, I showed. So for the one where you enforce physical constraints within neural network, even to within machine precision, I would say the main limitation is that if you don't code it well or efficiently, uh, you will the, net, the neural network will be significantly harder to optimize than, for example, a brute force neural network. Um, and that becomes even more obvious when you go to nonlinear constraints where you need those conversion layers or however you manage to uh, transform, reformulate the constraints inside of your neural network architecture, you need it to be very efficient. Otherwise, it's hard to, gain, to get the same level of performance than you would with a brute force uninformed neural network. Uh, and then for, this, for the second method, the climate invariant network, I would say the main drawback is to have a good, strong physical prior of how you go from one regime to the other. So in the case of thermodynamics, uh, the, therm the thermodynamics of climate change, uh, we are quite lucky in a sense because the closest Clapeyron equation gives us an extremely strong prior as to how water is going to evolve as the climate warms um, in the atmosphere. But um, I'm still looking for good output rescaling. I've been uh, trying for now, and I have a lot of physics background, but still it's been months of trying tens of different rescalings to find which one is the best. So even if the results can be very dramatic uh, and satisfying, once you find the right scaling, I would say finding this physical prior requires a lot of collaboration with domain knowledge experts. Um, so asking a lot of people around you in practice. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, the last question, well, I think it might be the last question because it's a long one, uh, is a combination of two questions here from Randall Barnes and Paul Hansen. Um, so when should or how should KGML topics be introduced to science students? For example, only in grad school? And that combined with a question from Paul, what do you wish you'd had in training? So any suggestions for our instructors of what we should teach when and where? I'm assuming training didn't mean like your training data set. It was just no, it means <laughs> okay. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, I wish I had more of a computer science background. Honestly, as an atmospheric scientist, I feel like my job is to be a data scientist, but for my application. And so I really think that I had more um, experience with with computer science coming into this thing. I can second that. Um, it's, the computational side is so important for pre-processing the data. Um, I guess if we were to give some percentage of the time that we actually spend training our models versus pre-processing the data, it'd be like 90 to 95 percent pre-processing as opposed to training. Uh, so really learning how to parallelize what we can or, um, yeah, just optimize that workflow and that, that pipeline before even getting to the training part um, makes up so much um, of our work. So being as efficient as possible in that uh, realm would have been very useful for me. And it's something that I've been having to pick up along the way. And I have had no formal training uh, per se, but I've just picked up and, and learned from different people um, I will jump in um, quickly and say, oh, oh, oh I was just no, gonna go say ahead. what Maria said about pre-processing, that's often where a lot of the science comes in is how do you pre-process? And that's, so there's the optimizing the pre-processing side, but I think Maria, you bring up a great point that's really at the heart of KGML, which is this knowledge part. And often that those decisions you had to make for what, what how did you standardize and why and what does the input mean 
is, is so fundamental to what you ultimately get out. And it's so rooted often in the science. So I think that's a really important point. And then Sherry, go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no worries. I was going to say that um, my background is more coming in as a um, someone in computer science and applied math. I think it's good to get through the building blocks of um, obviously basic computer science and then working your way up to machine learning um, with statistics. But I think there could be more classes that merge um, machine learning and uh, domain knowledge. So I think I think once people, it doesn't have to be at the ground level though. I think that's probably uh, just because of the number of steps it takes to get through the computer science and machine learning curriculum probably would mostly be for people at the grad school level. But I think I, think I see a lot of um, people in my home department, which is an applied math department, who have a lot of computational skills, but um, have to learn the domain knowledge from their lab, which uh, is, is fine. And, um, you know, we read a lot of papers and get integrated and talk to people. But I think having the structure of a class to merge those would, would have been helpful for myself and for a lot of people that I know in my, my own department. What would be in such a class, this may say? Any ideas? Um, I mean, I guess, I think it would be like machine learning for say earth sciences and it could be teaching um, the many like source of data that we use, for example, remote sensing data is very commonly used and uh, not only data processing, but then also at least the fundamentals of the physical process these that you're dealing with. And um, I think there is a lot of pitfalls that happen to people with little domain knowledge where uh, you're not sure uh, if your results really make sense. And so there's a lot of like spinning of the wheels um, when you're not yet familiar with the domain. And I think a lot of effort can be spent going in the wrong direction uh, when you don't have the intuition yet. And obviously that's very hard to build. I mean, I think being interdisciplinary is inherently just very difficult. And maybe you just have to go take the fundamental courses um, in the domain that you're in as well. But I think maybe maybe a course with the angle of you already know computer science, um, like here are some applications that are commonly uh, using uh, computer science tools that could be helpful. I'm not sure, just, just speculating. I could add another topic for that course, maybe translating between machine learning language and earth science language things like a grid cell versus a pixel <laughs> it's just a, a language course for it yes uh, i agree on this and well i also agree that um, i spend too much time on downloading data and writing batch jobs and so on but so i think maybe something which should be more included in, in training is kind of interdisciplinary work you know like learning how to work with different fields because oh, I think it's impossible to catch up with all the developments in climate science and in computer science and so on. So it would be actually great to um, yeah, start or learning early at how to collaborate with others and see what others need and what we can provide. And I think building on what Marlene just said, uh, what I've noticed is that the, the labs I work with uh, recently started hiring students with both atmospheric science and computer science background. And I think that's the ideal setting to make it work is you really want a cohort of students that get along well and that can work with each, uh, with each other and teach each other uh, their specialty fields. Um, and I think you'll never be perfect in one domain or the other, but it's mostly bringing people together on similar projects with a lot of time spent together is probably for me one of the best way to have new ideas emerge that you hadn't thought of it before, thought of before. Tom, are you saying that when they hire, they hire some people who are machine learning people and some people who are atmospheric science, or do they hire people who already have both? No, I think it's almost impossible to find people who have both, and I don't, I don't know that it's necessary because if you're motivated to learn the other one, I, I think people should still have a shot at, at being hired. I, 
I think it's like hiring people from who have both, uh, one with the other and putting them all together, uh, but in the same lab, not having a CS lab and a neuroscience lab on uh, opposite sides of campus at some time email, putting everyone in the same lab, uh, I think could be a new model. Well, I think that is an awesome way to end this, which is really this concept of collaboration and that we really can't figure this all out. Because I, I think Ria's point, you know, or Marlena's point actually, you can't learn all of climate and all of machine learning and computer science in one brain. Well, maybe somebody can, but, but I'm not capable of it. And so really, I think ending this, this panel discussion and the representatives we had here talking really span the space of really the domain to, to more of the computer science side. And so, um, thank you. I think this is going to be a challenge we, that we are faced in many universities in the coming years of how do we do this right. And so, yes, we need to put everybody together in the same building, right, and have them be friends and good things will come of it. And so thank you, everybody. Yeah. I just want to say I think it's no coincidence that many of the people who are here come from labs like this, who are already trying to merge a lot of those together. So. Thank so with you, that, thank you everyone. This was a great session and thank you everybody who's been watching um, and all the great questions. And there were definitely many, especially specific questions we did not have a chance to get to. Feel free, um, all of the speakers are happy to receive emails and, and I think chat offline if there's interest. So thank you again and we'll see you all tomorrow for our last day of our KGML workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much.